What did Jesus say about his return to this earth and the end of time? On Tuesday night of Passion Week, the very week that led up to his crucifixion, Jesus talked about his second coming in what is known as the Olivet Discourse, recorded in Matthew 24 and 25. An understanding of Matthew 24 will show us where we stand in the stream of time. In this video, we are going to study the signs of the times straight from the mouth of Jesus. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the notification button so that you don't miss any of my future videos. If you find this video helpful, please like and share. In the prophecy of Matthew 24, Jesus described events that would occur in the distant future. If you want to know what's going to happen to those of us who are living in these end times, stay tuned. My pledge to you will be using the Bible to explain itself. No guesswork required. Jesus knew that his followers could easily fall prey to false teachers and false signs. Before he discussed the signs of his second coming, he warned his followers against being deceived. Jesus did not tell his disciples that his second coming would occur some 2,000 years in the future. That would have been disheartening to them. Instead, he warned them of a delay. He made it clear that he would not be returning right away. Matthew 24:48 is a parable of two supervisors, and one of them states, My master is delayed. Matthew 24:48 reads, but if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour that he is not aware of. Matthew twenty five nineteen reads, After a long time the Lord of those servants came, and settled accounts with them. In a third parable about ten sleepy maidens, Jesus compared himself to a bridegroom and said plainly, As the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Matthew 25, 5. He also implies the delay in other verses. Matthew 24, 6 reads, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. Matthew 14, 14 reads, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The Olivet Discourse occurred after dark on the Tuesday before the crucifixion. Jesus had spent the day teaching and healing in the temple court. His enemies had repeatedly tried to trip him up with loaded questions. Most of the listeners believed him to be a military king. They wanted him to conquer the Romans. They were not looking for a savior. By this time, Jesus had spent three and a half years ministering to the people, and very few of them had accepted him and his teachings. In two days, most would be calling for his blood. They would be part of a maddened crowd that would scream for him to be crucified. Jesus foresaw all this. By Tuesday evening, his heart was breaking. He knew that unless the Jewish nation changed its course, the people would suffer terrible retribution. Their rebellion would so infuriate the Romans that the emperor would send armies in AD 70 that would destroy Jerusalem and wipe the temple off the face of the earth. Jesus mourned over Jerusalem because it did not have to be destroyed. In Matthew 23, 37, and 38, he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hand gathers her brood under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. When the disciples of Christ heard these words, they were stunned. How could the temple of God, the jewel of the nation, be forsaken and desolate? They began talking to Jesus about the temple and its beauty. It was then that Jesus foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. Matthew 24, 1 reads, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, 
Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. This was unbelievable to the disciples. For almost fifty years, King Herod and his successors had been rebuilding the temple at enormous expense. Its fabulous marble walls glistened in the setting sun. Gold plate flashed and glowed around the main entrance. Some of the massive temple stones were almost perfectly squared and smooth. But Jesus said, There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. This was a disaster of such proportions that the disciples imagined Jesus must be talking about the end of the world. Once all the crowds had dispersed for the evening, Peter, Andrew, James, and John asked Jesus to explain his prediction of a few hours earlier. Matthew 24, 3 reads, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the close of the age? In Matthew 24 and 25, you can read Jesus' answer to the disciples. Please note that the disciples asked a dual question, which reveals how confused they were. They combined two distinct events. When will this be? They asked referring to the destruction of the temple. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Referring to the end of the world. The four disciples were so appalled with the prediction of the destruction of the temple that they imagined this would occur at the end of the world at the second coming of Jesus. They supposed that only the end of the world could bring about the destruction of the principal site of worship of the true God. Christ's statements about the two events can be sorted out fairly easily, and you will notice that Jesus provided distinct and different signs for the two important events. However, both lists were short. The more detailed lists he entrusted to Daniel and John in the form of visions. View my Daniel and Revelation videos in the links below. In regards to the destruction of the Temple of God in Jerusalem, Jesus provided one unmistakable sign, the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place. Matthew twenty four fifteen reads, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What does this prediction mean? Jesus explained it in Luke 21.20, which reads, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In regards to the end of the world, Jesus gave a very short list of signs. The first is the preaching of the gospel in all the world. Matthew twenty four fourteen reads, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Then Jesus looks into the future and mentions the 1260 years of papal supremacy. Matthew twenty four twenty one reads, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. In Matthew twenty four twenty seven, Jesus describes the actual manner of his return on clouds and visible as lightning. Matthew twenty four twenty six and 27 reads, Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. 
For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. There is nothing secret in his return. Paul the Apostle described the second coming as noisy. There will be trumpets sounding. 1 Corinthians 15.51 reads, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Jesus looks into the distant future and tells us that after the 1260 years of papal supremacy are fulfilled, there would be astronomical phenomena. Matthew 24, 29-31 reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Were all the predictions of Jesus fulfilled? Point number one, the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. The historian Josephus reports that Roman soldiers under the direction of Cestius Gallus in November AD 66 surrounded Jerusalem. Victory was easily within reach of the Romans, but for some unaccountable reason the Romans retreated. Christian Jews fled from the city and moved north to a colony at Pella, southeast of Lake Galilee. Jesus had warned them to flee to the hills, and to the hills they fled. Not one Christian is known to have perished in the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70. Daniel also foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. Daniel 9, 24-27 speaks of a desolated prince who would appear upon the wing of abomination to destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. The tenth Fretenses and the twelfth Fulminata were among the Roman legions that fought at Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers worshipped their standards. Historian Tertullian stated that the camp religion of the Romans is all through a worship of the standards. Joseph writes that after the Roman soldiers destroyed the Jerusalem temple, they carried their standards into the temple court and setting them up opposite the eastern gate, there they sacrificed to them. The Roman army that stood in the holy place and destroyed and desolated Jerusalem was an idolatrous people. The army was indeed an abomination and a desecration that produced desolation. The abomination that Daniel wrote about and Jesus predicted was Rome. Daniel 8.13 warns of the transgression that makes desolate. This prediction has a double application. It pointed forward to the Roman army that destroyed literal Jerusalem and the literal temple of worship of the true God, but it also pointed to the second phase of the little horn that represents papal Rome, the medieval Roman church and her substitute traditions that set itself up as a substitute priesthood with substitute sacrifices. The prophecies of Daniel 2, 7, and 8 through 12 run parallel. Each prophecy starts in Daniel's day and continues through real time to the end of the world. The various symbols for the Babylonian, Persian, and Greek empires are all followed by a symbol for Rome, iron in Daniel 2, a monster in Daniel 7, and a little horn in Daniel 8. Did the transgression that makes desolate of Daniel 8.13 trample on God's sanctuary and his host? The answer is definitely yes. In its pagan empire phase, Rome destroyed the Jerusalem temple, which had been God's principal site of public worship for almost a thousand years. The Roman emperors also persecuted the early Christians. Papal Rome also persecuted believers of the true God. Furthermore, the medieval Roman Christian church also obscured the continual Tamid ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. The Roman Catholic Church created a false priesthood, 
a false sacrifice, a false head of the church, and a false way of salvation. Viewed from this viewpoint, the abomination of desolation is seen to be a false system of worship. Jesus foretold this apostasy. Matthew 24.10 reads, Many will fall away. Paul the Apostle also warned of this apostasy. Acts 20, 29, and 30 reads, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Second Thessalonians 2, 7, and 8 reads, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The lawless one was to be revealed at some point future to Paul's time. But Paul's word clearly teaches that once the lawless one was revealed, he would continue until the second coming of Jesus. Point number two, the Great Tribulation. Jesus predicted that his followers would suffer tribulation. Matthew 24, 9 reads, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. He also referred to tribulation in Matthew 24, 21, and 22, where he foretold a great tribulation, one unlike any tribulation before it or since, and it was to be so severe that if those days had not been shortened, No human being would be saved. Tribulation is translated from a Greek word meaning trouble, distress, and suffering. The Bible contains numerous predictions about tribulation. The first tribulation mentioned in the Olivet Discourse was to begin within the lifetime of the disciples. Jesus said, They will deliver you up to tribulation. The followers of Jesus had been persecuted throughout the centuries since these words were first spoken by Jesus. Satan hates the followers of Jesus, and he hates the truth. He has done his best to wipe both from the face of the earth. The other tribulation Jesus spoke of, one unlike any other before it or since, was fulfilled during the 1260-year days of Daniel 725 as part of the persecution by the papal system when they used the strong arm of the civil government to banish heretics and enforce their decrees. There is a third tribulation or time of trouble, also unlike any other before it or since, foretold in Daniel 12, 1 and 2. It will take place when the great Prince Michael shall stand up. The angel Gabriel told Daniel, At that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life. This third unique tribulation will occur in connection with the second coming of Jesus and the resurrection of the righteous dead. It will occur after the court of judgment described in Daniel 7, 9-14 has finished examining the books. It will bring terror to the wicked, but God's people will be delivered from it. This last tribulation will be brief, but it will involve the seven last plagues. The great tribulation of the 1260-year days was unlike any other in that it lasted for centuries. It affected both the followers of Jesus and unbelievers. At times it destroyed a fourth or even a third of the population. To learn more about the various tribulations, study Revelation 2, verse 10, 3, verse 10, and 6, verses 9 through 11. Of the four disciples that were with Jesus that Tuesday night, James and Peter were later imprisoned in Jerusalem by King Herod at the request of the Jewish leaders. James was beheaded. Peter was rescued by an angel, but years later he was martyred in Rome. John the Beloved was dipped in hot oil. He miraculously survived and was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he was given the visions of revelation. Jesus taught the disciples that tribulation was a part of the Christian experience through the coming ages. Jesus said in John fifteen eighteen through 25 If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. 
That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And John 16.33 reads, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There is lots of distress and trouble that we can avoid as Christians. By choosing to live a healthy lifestyle, we avoid chronic health problems and the suffering that entails. By being courteous to others, we help to diffuse anger. Proverbs 15.21 reads, A soft answer turns away wrath. Prior changes things too. Psalms 50.15 reads, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But some trouble is inescapable. Jesus taught us that in the world you will have tribulation. But he also said, But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Christ will be with us in our troubles. Luke twenty one sixteen through 18 reads, You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. What a paradox. Some of us will be killed, but we won't be lost for eternity. Psalm 116.15 reads, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. At the second coming, Jesus already overcome the world, will raise every one of his sleeping people back to life. First Thessalonians 4.16 reads, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Point number three, signs in the heavens. Matthew twenty four twenty nine and 30 reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Luke twenty one twenty five through 27 reads this way. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. In Matthew twenty four thirty three, Jesus said, so also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. And in Luke twenty one twenty eight, it reads, When these things begin to take place, look up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. I believe these signs in the sun, moon, and stars have already been fulfilled. Matthew twenty four twenty nine says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Jesus is referring to the 1260-day years, and prior to his appearance in the clouds, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. John repeats this list of phenomena in Revelation 6, 12-14, which reads, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? On November 1, 1755, the Great Lisbon Earthquake struck. It is still listed as one of the major earthquakes of world history. 
on November 1, All Saints Day, and a Saturday around 9.30 a.m., the ground roared and trembled, destroying public edifices. Homes, churches, government buildings, and palaces swayed for two minutes. Buildings crumbled and crashed to the ground. After another pause, there was another earthquake. Then the day turned into night as the dust thrown up by the falling masonry settled back down. People were trapped in the rubble. Fires broke out. Tidal waves surged up the Tagus River and engulfed crowds that had run for safety to the open waterfront, away from the falling buildings. Sir Charles Lyell reported that fire mysteriously leaped out of cracks in the ground. Recent studies give scientific support to this possibility. When the quake hit, it also leveled the North African city of Fess and Meknes, which were 400 miles away. The quake was felt as far away as Strasbourg, 1,100 miles distant. Rivers and lakes were disturbed all the way to Scandinavia. About 6 p.m., a tidal wave struck the island of Barbados in the Caribbean, some 4,000 miles away. As a comparison, imagine the 1906 earthquake that destroyed San Francisco, also destroying Los Angeles, nearly 400 miles away. Imagine it also shaking Seattle, Salt Lake City, Denver, and Albuquerque, and disturbing the Great Lakes and even the Hudson River. Sir Thomas Kendrick, the then director of the British Museum, wrote that although it wasn't the greatest disaster of its kind, it was a colossal seismic disturbance that was felt over so large an area that it caused general alarm and astonishment and a great output of scientific speculation, as well as theological and philosophical speculation, much of it centering on the relationship to God. On May 19, 1780, the dark day struck New England. The Declaration of Independence was only three years old, and because of the Revolutionary War, many men were away from their homes. Beginning on May 12, the skies over New England became overcast, and the air was hazy. By May 19, the sun was red the entire day. A large black cloud loomed ominous in the southwest. A wind spread the cloud to Boston, Portland, Maine, and beyond. It eventually affected 25,000 square miles. Cattle returned lowing to their barns. Cocks crowed and roosted for the night. People flocked into the streets in fear and many rushed to their churches. The Connecticut legislature adjourned at 11 o'clock because the members couldn't see each other. There was a smoky smell in the air and also soot on the water and ash washed up along the shore. Numerous fires were known to be raging in northern Vermont, New Hampshire, and in Canada. No other dark days have been reported to be as dark or to have lasted for so many hours as occurred on May 19, 1780. Catholic persecution ceased in Europe in the middle of the 18th century. The last heretic to be martyred in France was a Reformed pastor who died in 1762. Pope Clement XIV personally outlawed the Jesuits in 1773. The timing of the dark day did in fact come right on time, as Jesus predicted. The Leonid star shower of November 13, 1833 began to attract attention along the eastern seaboard of North America about 9 the previous evening, as the frequency of meteors increased well above what would normally be observed. By 2 a.m., the display was bright enough to wake people up from their sleep. The peak occurred at 4 a.m. On the Great Plains, Native Americans recorded the event on their calendars and named the ensuing season the Plenty Stars or Storm of Stars Winter. In sparsely settled California, a military company saw the sky completely thickened with meteors. The army horses tried to stampede. It was reported that the star shower ran to 60,000 or more an hour. Some people described it as a snowstorm of stars. The meteors seemed to proceed from a central point. Many of them left a glowing trail or train. As the thousands of trains lingered, all radiating outward from the common center point, they appeared like the ribs of a gigantic umbrella, 
Some meteors appeared as large as the moon. Some were described as bursting into shiny fragments. They burst silently. Denison Olmsted, professor of science and mathematics at Yale, noted that the meteors radiated outward from a point in the sickle of the constellation Leo. The display was named Leonid, after the constellation Leo. Calculations were formulated and a theory was developed. According to the theory, the comet Temple Tuttle swings around the sun on a far-flung elliptical orbit that carries it through the Earth's orbit and out beyond Uranus some two billion miles from the sun. The comet is disintegrating and it's shedding particles all along its orbital path. Our Earth passes through the comet's orbit each year in November. Every 33rd or 34th year, our Earth may transverse the main swarm just to the rear of the comet. If it does, we enjoy a celestial star shower like the one of November 13, 1833. But let's consider November 13, 1833. Many believe the falling stars were a sign of the last days. Henry Dana Ward, a Harvard graduate and the rector of the Anglican Church of St. Jude in New York City, wrote to the New York Journal of Commerce, We felt in our hearts that it was a sign of the last days, for truly the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken by a mighty wind. Revelation 6.13 this language of the prophet has always been received as metaphorical. He said, yesterday it was literally fulfilled. All three of these signs qualify as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy because of their magnitude, their location, and their timing. Will these signs be repeated immediately before Jesus returns to earth? They may be. But the signs that were to take place immediately after the tribulation of those days have been fulfilled as stated above. We now stand at the very end of time. We stand between the star shower of Revelation 6.13 and the sign of the heavens rolling back like a scroll and the mountains and islands moving out of their places of Revelation 6.14. We stand at the brink of the time of trouble of Daniel 12, 1. Point number four. What else did Jesus say about the end of time? Jesus warned his disciples that the day and the hour of his coming has not been revealed. Matthew twenty four thirty six reads, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. However, Jesus did describe to the disciples what the condition of the world would be like at the end of time. Matthew twenty four thirty seven reads, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. From this verse we learn that the earth will not be so damaged or poisoned that it can no longer support life. People will still be employed in the normal activities of life until the time of the end. We do not need to worry about space travel or space colonization for the survival of mankind. How was it in Noah's day? Genesis 6, 5 reads, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. The antediluvians were corrupt and perverse. God destroyed them because of their wickedness. Jesus warns in Matthew 24, 12 that because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The time of the end will be a lawless time. The Holy Spirit is withdrawing from the earth because the people have rejected God. And with the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit, God is also withdrawing his protection. Disasters and calamities are becoming more and more intense and frequent. Soon the earth will be left completely unprotected and the people who have not given 
given their lives over to the protection of God will be under the control of the devil and the legions of demonic spirits who will wreak havoc on the earth as they did in the days of Noah. Of that time we read in Second Timothy 3, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Apostle Paul warns in 1 Timothy 4, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5 reads, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And Peter warns in Second Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. No one knows the day or the hour that Jesus will return, but we can know the season. We can recognize when his coming is near. Jesus said in Matthew twenty four thirty two. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. He has warned us that his actual appearance will come as a surprise even to his most ardent followers. In Matthew twenty four thirty three, he cautions us to watch therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. In Matthew twenty four forty four, he says, You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. In the days of Noah, people engaged in their daily routines and totally ignored the warnings of the impending doom that was to befall the earth. Noah spent a 120 years building the ark. God set a date beyond which he would no longer allow such wickedness upon the earth. Genesis 6, 3 reads, and the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his day shall be one hundred and twenty years. Noah spent those years warning the people of the impending calamity. Hebrews 11.7 reads, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world. How did Noah condemn the world? While Noah was giving his warning message to the people, his works testified of his sincerity. He gave the people an example of believing what God said. All that he possessed, he invested in the building of the ark. Every blow struck upon the ark was a witness to the people, and God provided another sign to the people of that generation. The unseen angels led the animals and birds to the ark. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female. If the people needed one last sign to heed Noah's warning of a coming flood, God gave it to them through the animals. So today God in his mercy has given us the great lines of prophecy and numerous warnings in the Bible so that his second coming will not take us unawares. Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? All you need to do is pray and ask him to help you to be ready. He is able to save you. Second Corinthians 12.9 reads, My grace is sufficient for you. 
for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In my next video, we will study the Hebrew festivals, which are many prophecies that help us understand the nearness of the second coming. Join me in my next video to learn more. Like and share this video if you found it helpful. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the notification button so you don't miss any of my future videos. Until next time, God bless you.